This was meant to mark the triumph of capitalism over communism. Instead, it saw the worst violence since the 1968 Soviet invasion. It shocks me and angers me and I find it distressing. Prague's battle of ideas became a war on the streets. A protest by idealists became a rampage by thugs. This is a story about what they were fighting for and how it all went so wrong. In late September, as the world was focused on the Sydney Olympics, the world's corporate champions converged on Prague. The event was the annual general meeting of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And the venue was pointedly symbolic. The old Communist Party Congress Centre, little used since the Communists were overthrown 11 years ago. For World Bank President James Wolfenson, fresh off the plane from the Olympics, it was a chance to repair the financiers' image, to reassert themselves as agencies committed to ending poverty. Two billion more people are going to come onto the planet in the next 25 years. And they'll all be going to developing countries. And unless something is done about that issue of poverty, there's no way you'll have peace in the world. But across town, in a far more modest venue, protesters were planning to make the bankers regret they came. Like Wolfenson, Domenica had also jetted in from Australia, fresh from the Melbourne protests against the World Trade Organization. I was quite heavily involved in the protests which went for the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and I got on a plane Wednesday night and I'm here and jet lagged. Domenica is part of a new global generation of protesters, linked by the internet and a shared disdain for capitalism. Young idealists like her plan their holidays or travels around a roadshow of protests. Yeah, oh no, well, my boyfriend lives here so it's kind of dual oh, purpose okay. for spending heaps of money. But... They've been called here via a website for a group called INPEG. They see moves to break down economic barriers and reshape third world economies as nothing more than ploys to exploit the poor. Essentially they are about helping those in power, which is the richer companies and richer countries, um, at the expense of everybody who's not in power, which is most of the planet. Does it rankle when the protesters see you as, as son of the, the chief blood-sucking pariah? Yes, it does. <laughs> Wouldn't it for you? I've spent the last five years uh, really uh, addressing frontally the issue of poverty. I've been to 110 countries, I've been in more slums and villages and dealt with more human stories than I think most of the demonstrators. And uh, so it rankles. Prague today is unrecognisable from its communist roots. The city has an air of central European prosperity. Its historic buildings have been restored, its emblems of past glory reinstated. There is a vibrant business culture here. Its post-communist youth pursue capitalism like they were born to it. What I'm hearing from the market is that there are two different segments. Dana and Jan are typical of the new generation. Fluent English speakers, they run a finance reference company with plans to expand abroad. For them, globalisation means a normal life. In the practical life, it means that you can drink Coke and uh, go to McDonald's. Uh, it also means you have big, uh, bigger opportunities. You can, you can really travel, you can get employed uh, abroad. And it was all achieved by protest. In 1989, the people took to the streets to demand freedom. Dana was then a 21-year-old student of Marxist economics started being really sort of um, cohesive in views that we don't want the regime, we don't want communism, we want liberty, we want travel, we want to have connections with the rest of the world. All were resolutely non-violent. They had candles, you know, they had candles and they came to police and they said, uh, you know, please go home, we, you know, we don't want you here, don't be violent. Within weeks, the Velvet Revolution, as it became known, had overthrown the regime and the country took a U-turn to market capitalism. 
the IMF was instrumental in creating this new culture, lending money to the new state on condition it privatised industries, cut back on state services and allowed in foreign businesses. The World Bank lent money to modernise the Soviet infrastructure. Thanks to a $50 million loan, the main electricity plant outside Prague is now clean, slimmed down and one-third privatised. But not everyone's been a winner. The cuts in subsidies have seen unemployment in the surrounding towns skyrocket. Tomasz Tajiszka is the pastor in the nearby city of Most. Samozřejmě to se nejspíš muselo stát, když když se tím, když se uvolnil trh. Nicméně dnes to znamená, že ti lidé šli několika násobně dolů se svým příjmem, což s tím se neumí dost dobře poradit a Znamená to obrovskou nezaměstnanost, která je dneska tady v Mostě 22% a do konce roku očekáváme kolem 30% nezaměstnanosti, což je víceméně katastrofická situace, se kterou si moc nikdo tady nedovede představit, co dělat. Tomáš heads the Czech branch of Jubilee 2000, a church-based group demanding debt relief. They argue the burden of repaying IMF and World Bank loans robs countries of money for health or education. This mock funeral represented an estimated 19,000 children who die of preventable disease each year. And you blame the IMF and the World Bank for those children dying? Uh, IMF and World Bank are one of the institutions who decide about that. But of course, uh, especially the national governments are responsible. <laughs> There have been protests against globalization in every country where the IMF and World Bank operate. IMF, they can't pay. How many kids will you kill today? But it's been relatively affluent Westerners who've had the time and resources to make it international. Chelsea Mosen was the front person for the Prague protests. She grew up in a well-to-do family in Atlanta, Georgia the headquarters of Coca-Cola. I have always been very um, very concerned about poverty issues and the idea that some people in the world have so little while very few people have so much. And um, seeing that in my travels and in my, my living in the US and in Bolivia, uh, I've been very, very concerned about that and want to do something about it. Chelsea arrived in Prague last June to help organize the protests, but here it's been a tough battle. While Czech anarchists were happy to be involved, there was little support from mainstream groups. Instead, thousands of residents simply left town in fear of riots. Shops boarded up their windows as thousands of police poured in to prepare for the protests. Even the horses were given riot gear. In the Czech Republic, we often get the question, well, if you, if you don't want capitalism, why do you want communism? It's not, it's not one or the other. We can go somewhere else, we believe. We can go somewhere where people around the world have a say in the, in the policies that they, they implement in their own countries and what they grow in their own countries, what they wear, where they educate themselves. But the movement against globalization goes far beyond fresh-faced idealism. Ultranationalists also oppose the IMF and World Bank, claiming open markets will see third world workers steal their jobs. Nearby, communist rallies called for global socialism instead while anarchists demanded an end to global government. It is a bizarre and at times dangerous confluence between groups with more differences than common ground. We're completely non-violent. If you look at Martin Luther King or Gandhi, you'll note that a non-violent direct action means very much that. You're doing something for, for a reason that you strongly believe in. By the day of the official Congress opening, more than 12,000 demonstrators had arrived for the main march. There's a huge diversity of people here and there certainly will be some blockading, whereas there's others who will prefer to keep it a bit calmer than that. <laughs> the single largest group was a thousand Italian anarchists, known as Yabasta, meaning that's enough. 
Sergio Julian, given the job of rallying the march, insisted the padding and gas masks were just for self-defense. Just protection against the violence of the police, because the violence comes from the police. So we have to protect ourselves, our brothers and sisters, but no, no sticks, no offensive weapons. Just water pistols. Just water yeah, pistols. Yeah, yeah, because we want to liquidate the IMF. It all began peacefully, Yabasta leading the main march, shadowed by a huge police escort. But the mood changed dramatically when they reached the bridge leading to the conference. A cordon of riot police and armoured personnel carriers blocked their path. As police called on them to disperse, the Yabasta anarchists geared up for their first charge. Cushioned by inner tubes, the charges caused little damage. But as more frustrated protesters joined in, a dangerous momentum was building. No provocatori. Sergio struggled to control the hotheads. What is the plan now? I don't know. We're trying to go on, but there are some provocators here. Trying provocators. But the violence that followed appeared intentional and planned. A group of Turkish communists began pulling back the police barriers. On cue, they began their attack. Whether by design or because of the international spotlight, the police showed extraordinary restraint. They used pepper spray and batons, but only to stop the protesters taking the last barrier. It was not the response the communists had hoped for. One by one, they began trying to provoke a police charge. The NPEG organisers tried hard to restrain the crowd. It was a losing battle. Inside the Congress Centre, the meeting began as planned, the delegates unaware of the storm building outside. Outside these walls, young people are demonstrating against globalisation. I believe deeply that many of them are asking legitimate questions and I embrace the commitment of a new generation to fight poverty. I share their passion and their questioning. Yes, we all have a lot to learn, but I believe we can move forward only if we deal with each other constructively and with mutual respect. But the bridge attacks were simply a diversion. On the roads outside, masked anarchists began full-scale attacks on the police lines. This time, no amount of appeals for calm by the INPEG organisers could stop them. Anarchists ripped up cobblestones and hurled them at police. Advertising billboards became fuel for burning barricades. When the protest looked like reaching the Congress centre, the police held the line with water cannons, the first time they had been used since the end of communism. For the people of Prague, who had overthrown a dictatorship without violence, it was a shocking sight. It is pretty shocking because uh, it's not the way to start communicating, you know, using, you know, stones, etc., and, and destroying mm. shops because I think then you sort of, the other party, of course, gets resistant in terms of uh, talking and also in terms of taking respect to these groups. So uh, I was rather shocked. As the afternoon wore on, the protests began to disperse. But the calm was short-lived. As darkness fell, the mob moved on to the city centre to attack the symbols of global capitalism. Throughout the day, most of the protest had been peaceful. But once again, a violent minority had hijacked it and destroyed the message the main groups had tried to bring. By morning, police had arrested more than 400 people and a shell-shocked city returned to work. Unlike INPEG, the main businesses had expected violence. McDonald's had even pre-ordered new windows. What had been planned as a three-day protest was effectively over. A chastened Chelsea Mosin faced the media to call for a day of peace.
like to say that we are very, very disappointed in what happened yesterday. We are extremely committed to nonviolence, and it is precisely because we are committed to nonviolence that we oppose the IMF and the World Bank and the violence they facilitate on the, around the world on a daily basis. Do you feel responsible for the violence that happened yesterday? I think we are very frustrated that it happened and very sad. I want to ask you yes or no, please. Would you ask us if we feel responsible for the 19,000 people? Children You're only me a question, but I was asking you a question, dying but every day. If you would not try to do anything against this, but to many, a mob rampage can't be dismissed as a side issue. In the global debate for hearts and minds, it has struck a devastating blow. The protest juggernaut will roll on again to more meetings in more cities. But Prague's not-so-velvet revolution may prove a fatal turning point for a movement that looked set to rock the world. The IMF was born in an earlier crisis, at the end of the Second World War. Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, delegates from... The founding countries gathered at the Bretton Woods Conference. Their mission was lofty, to foster financial stability and indeed peace, in a world badly shaken by the depression of the 1930s. The IMF's functions then were narrow to oversee fixed exchange rates and to provide countries with short-term loans to cover balance of payments problems. Fifty years later, the IMF has taken on a vastly expanded job description. It now demands radical economic restructuring as a condition of its loans. Critics say it's contributed to the developing world's debt burden and so worsened today's global crisis.